Good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Marquez with PMMI Business Intelligence. PMMI, along with CPA, the Association for Contract Packagers and Manufacturers, and IOPP, the Institute of Packaging Professionals, would like to welcome you to today's webinar on the new McKinsey & Company report, Packaging Solutions, Poised to Take Off. It is my pleasure to introduce Nick Santhanam, Senior Partner and Global Leader of the McKinsey Industrials Practice, and Shekhar Varanasi, partner in the McKinsey Industrials Practice, who leads their work in food processing, packaging, and service equipment. McKinsey & Company is a global management consulting firm deeply committed to helping clients achieve lasting success. For 90 years, their primary objective has been to serve as their client's most trusted external advisor. Now with consultants in over 120 cities in over 60 countries across industries and functions. Their report foresees the large fragmented packaging sector continuing to generate but several disruptive trends will require the industry to develop new business models, operational efficiencies, and technology integration programs. Over the next hour, Nick and Shaker will share insights from the report, including major trends and significant opportunities for those companies willing to move fast. A few housekeeping notes. Everyone is muted throughout the webinar. If you have any questions you would like to ask the presenters, please type your question in the chat box that is located on your screen. Uh, and there is also a questions box as well. At the end of this presentation, which will last approximately 45 to 50 minutes, Nick and Shaker will be available to answer your questions. At this time, I would like to hand the webinar over to Nick and Shaker. Thanks, Rebecca. Really appreciate uh, the introduction and welcome all. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Today, what we want to do is, uh, as Rebecca mentioned, walk you through some of the main findings of the work we did, which was spread over six months, looking at the packaging sector. So let's start off by defining what do we really mean by the packaging sector and how big it is. So if you see the packaging sector globally, it's roughly a trillion dollars. And it is pr pretty much broken up across different types of material, whether it is board, flexible, rigid plastics, what you see on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you see the sample players. So want to get calibrated on when we talk packaging, what are we talking about, which is roughly trillion dollars of which 95% is the packaging material and roughly 5% of roughly $45 billion is the packaging equipment space. That is the space we want to talk about today. If you go to the next slide, you will see that the packaging sector is really driven predominantly by the consumer segment, which is roughly 60%, i.e. packaging used in food, in drinks, in healthcare, in cosmetics, and roughly 40% of that is in the industrial space, i.e. packaging for industrial purposes. Furthermore, when you then break it out by geography, you will see that Asia Pacific is the biggest region followed by North America, followed by the Western, Western Euro space. So this is what the landscape we looked at. This is the space we looked at to see what really is going on. If you then go to the next slide, you'll see that this sector, again, no surprise, is really fragmented, meaning there are a lot of small companies, and which means is you really have the share of the top three players, which is shown on the right-hand side, is very small. So if you look at both, for example, the three top players have 15% of the market, and there is a huge long tail of companies which have the remaining 85% of the market. That is true in flexibles, that's true in rigid plastics, that is pretty much true in every sector. And we as McKinsey, and I think this is an industry terminology, we look at the Huffendale Index, which is basically looking at the concentration of the players in this market. You will find, you'll find that um, it's, it's extremely small, which means there are a lot of players, and it's not like one player or two players or even five players have a big share of the market. This could be because of two reasons. One is, as we all know, the capital investment needed is not that high to enter the space. And you have given packaging materials are bulky and given it's 
hard to transport over long distances. They tend to be local, i.e. they end up being clo local, close to the customers, and hence you see this big fragmentation. That's the good news or the bad news, depending on which way you see it. But it does cause a problem is when you're a, when you're a company, an individual company, it makes it very hard to grow organically. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that this has historically led for the packaging companies to be stuck between the middle. You have on the one side is the raw material suppliers, companies like BASF, Dow, DuPont, and so on. And on the other side, you've got the end customers, the big CPG companies, companies like PepsiCo, Coke, Nestle, Unilever. You find what happens is the innovations are driven by the two ends of the, the spectrum, which is reflected in the kind of margins the company makes, and the packaging companies, the packaging solution companies end up being in the middle. What that means is you'll see it in the next page, the economic profits, and let me actually define what economic profits is. Economic profits is return on invested capital minus cost of capital times invested capital. Meaning if you're a company, you're borrowing money either from your debt holders or your equity holders. So that is your cost of capital. And ROIC is the return you make on your business. So obviously, if you borrow money from somebody for 5% and you make 6%, that's good. Versus if you borrow money from somebody for 5% and only make 4%, you don't and you lose money. That is the premise of economic profits. And what you see on the slide is the, the light blue line at the bottom is the economic profit shown as a percentage of revenue for the packaging companies. And the, uh, the light black line on the top is for the overall industrials. And what you will see here is the segment has historically lagged the broad industrial segments. And furthermore, not only is lagged, it has destroyed economic profits. So if you look from 2002 till 2012, we have been minus 1.2%, it's got better, but we are still destroying value. And that's not a surprise given the comment I made before, which is the innovation historically has been in the two ends of the spectrum. Then if you fast forward the movie and sort of say, how does life look past 2012 and go to the next slide, what you'll find is the companies have sort of looked at this and said, the only way we are gonna get out of the middle is by building scale. Because at the end of the day, you can look and say, okay, I can create economic profits. And to create economic profits, I have to change my ROIC, my return on invested capital. And one way to do it is to get scale. And by getting scale, I get better margin, I get the synergies. And what you'll see is between 2013 and 2017 is the number of M&A deals per company for the 45 large companies. And we did this across even for the, the broader tail, this trend holds true, is the number of deals have gone up roughly 2x. The median size has stayed relatively flat. And that means really what they've done is they have acquired companies to get scale, and that has been the way to create value. Furthermore, if you go to the next slide, what you'll find is that has really allowed them, and you can see them in the numbers, is allowed them to change their financial performance. So if you look from 2002 to 2012, the chart I showed before, where the economic profits were negative, it was getting better, but it was still negative, the industry was running at 8.3%. The last four years it has gone up to 10.3%. So there's a 30% bump or 200 uh, basis point improvement. The capital turns, how quickly do you turn your capital has gone from 1.8 to 1.9. That's a 10% improvement. And that has actually allowed this industry in the last four years to create positive economic profits, i.e. they've gone from minus 0.7 to plus 0.7. So one is they've reversed the trend. Two is obviously they've gone on the positive side. And the trend has gone from value destruction to value creation. So what does this really mean? This really means is in the last four years, we look back over the last 17 years, but just to break it up into chunks, the first half or maybe two thirds of the period, the industry was destroying economic profit and was fragmented and was really trailing the industrials. But over the last four years, over the last five years, the segment has sort of started to reverse the trend, has basically started moving from negative to positive, and 
more important is you're starting to see it in the financial performance and you have started to see that in increased positive economic profit, which you see in this slide. So if you look at this slide, what you'll find is the period of 2002 to 2007 was value destruction. So we were minus 1.2%. We were 0.9% in 2007, right before the big crash. And well, the line at the top is the industrial segment. So they were making profits, we were not. The last, the next five years, which is from the middle of 2000. 2008 till 2012, we reverted towards zero, which is we didn't create value, but we didn't destroy value either. And then the last five years, the 2013 to 2018 has been a period of value creation, which is we have moved from minus 0.1 or roughly zero, meaning we really didn't create any economic profits to roughly 0.6, meaning for every dollar of uh, revenue, we are creating 0.6 dollars of economic profit, or 0 0.06, sorry. So that says is we are starting to close the gap to the industrial segment. If you then go to the next slide, and sort of say, okay, this is all fantastic. How does that put us with respect to other sectors? So let me explain this chart. What you'll see on the chart is we have rank order the various industrial segments, starting from cables and wires, you see the packaging equipment, you see the food equipment, the power equipment, and so on. We have rank ordered them from the most value destruction to the highest value creation. So in this particular chart, what you will see is in the period 2002 to 2007, cables and wires as a sector was the most value destruction at minus 1.4. We were not that far off at minus 1.3. And on the other end was the electrical equipment and the multi-application components, which were running at 3.2 and 3.4%. When you then go to the next chunk of period from 2008 to 2012, you will see we have got better. We have gone from minus 1.3 to minus 0.3. And before we were the second last in performance, now we are fifth from the performance, but we have improved. And then come to the last period, which is the, the recent period from 2013 to 2017. One, we have improved our position, but two, which is important if you're a shareholder or a different stakeholder, is we are now value creation. We have gone from minus 0.3 to plus 0.8, and we are creating value as a sector. We are creating value as a segment for the various stakeholders. If you go to the next page, that's what I told you is looking in the back, looking in the past and sort of say, what does the past tell us? And the past tells us is we were not doing great, but we have got better. Here comes the, the, news or the, the even better news, I would say. We as a segment are now in a better shape just as various global mega disruptions are starting to happen. We call them disruption 2.0. And description 2.0 is defined as basically where it is, we are dealing with different things. Before description 1.0 was just doing things differently. Description 2.0 is about doing different things. And there are five big trends which are starting to happen, which all have a positive impact or should have a positive impact on the packaging sector. One, there is a shift towards sustainable materials. There is a big demand from various parts of the consumers, the various parts of the customer segments, looking from climate change and just the broader circular economy asking for sustainable materials. Again, the companies, the sector which can play the lead on this is packaging. Two, there is a lot of disruptive technologies happening, AI, blockchain, augmented reality, and we'll talk about that shortly. All of that can be enabled or can be benefited or you can get a multiplier effect through packaging. Three, there's a change in consumer behavior. A great example is our generation, our, previous, our parents' generation used to go to restaurants for eating. Now Uber Eats and Postmates and DoorDash is taking on, which means food is being delivered to your house, which again needs more packaging. Similarly, before people would go to retail, the start of the e-commerce, e-commerce means more packaging, more things needs to be delivered to your house. Again, that's driving a different demand from the packaging company, different packaging solutions. 
Fourth is growth in emerging markets. So this is a white space, a new market. For example, you look at large emerging markets like India and China. There is a big rise of the middle class. There's a big rise of the demographics, which is demanding all the things which has been in the Western hemisphere for quite some time. So that is really driving new markets for broad economy, but has the multiplier economy, a multiplier effect for the packaging space. And last but not for the least is there's an increased use of flexible materials, just given the customer preference, given what the market demands. So as you look at all of these five trends, these are all tailwinds for the packaging sector. And all of this really is coming in when the sector itself is getting positioned better because of its better economic performance to take benefit of that. Going to the next slide. What you'll see is, and we call this the PPP thing, if you look at packaging, it has, its role has evolved. Historically, the role of packaging material was to protect. You take the most expensive stuff, you take the most fragile stuff, you take the stuff you care about, and to protect it, you put it in a packaging material, whether it's a cardboard box or, a, or an aluminum can. Over time, that role has evolved. It has moved from protect to promote. I mean, how many times have we seen our kids, you know, we get them the most expensive gift and they really do want to play with the box and not with the gift itself. And that's because the way it promotes, the way it, it appeals to the audience has changed. And so you're starting to see the packaging material, the packaging solution play a bigger role in promoting the product, whether promoting the virtue, promoting what's great about it, or even driving the impulse purchase or the instant gratification for the end consumer. And last but not the least, and I'm sure this will continue to evolve, packaging has now moved on to a role of what we call performing, meaning it actually performs a different role than what it has historically performed. So what does that mean? Let's go to the next slide. As I said, promote is a great example. You sort of now are starting to see examples of augmented reality where the packaging is just not a dumb packaging, but it's a more lively packaging, which enrich enriches the user experience. Great example is a smart bottle cap, right? Which drives medical adherence, drives better user experience. And who would have thought that's important when you're sick? It of course does matter a lot. And then the great thing about how do you use this for making user reordering, replenishing, and retaining easy. So that's all in the promote. In the perform, this is the point we were making before about AI and blockchain and augmented reality coming on with foot safety becoming big, foot authenticity becoming big, blockchain is starting or will start to play a role in that. And the enabler of blockchain or the beneficiary of blockchain will be the packaging material on top to drive that. Similarly, putting sensors in packaging to ensure product quality and safety that's not just the job of protecting the, the package, as we've said before, it is actually performing a different task. And last but not the least, this has been around, but it's starting to sort of get to the next version, which is the inventory management through RFID tags or different sensors or digital marks, which really allows you to drive better traceability, better tractability, real-time tracing, so that you as an end consumer or you as a middleman can actually know where the package is and it really allows it to perform a different task. Next slide, please. So, so far we have been talking in a monolithic way. We have been talking about the packaging sector. We have been talking about the trillion dollar uh, sector. We now want to sort of go one level below and sort of saying, okay, that's great. All are equal, but some are more equal. Let's look at not packaging overall, but let's look at the various sub-segment. If you remember on slide one, we talked about $900 billion of packaging and we said, hey, it comprises of different segments such as glass, metal, flexible. And so here we did the same thing, which is we took the same, we took the segments, which you see on the left-hand side and said, how have the segments done in ROIC, Return on Invested Capital, over the last four years? Each dot is that of a company, and what you'll see, the, the, the vertical line is the median. No surprise, 
it is not homogeneous, right? I mean, none of the sectors themselves are homogeneous. You can look at the lines, they're all over the place, right? You see them as low as roughly 11% or 12% ROIC to as high as 21%. And so for example, just I'll call your attention to, if you look at paper and board, they run roughly 11% ROIC. If you look at flexible plastics, they run roughly 20%. So there's a 2X delta. But what is even more interesting is within a segment in each one is a dot is a company and to protect the innocent, we have not named the companies. But what you'll find is there is a widespread even within a segment. Picking diversified, for example, you have a company which is running roughly at 40% ROIC and then you have a company which is running roughly at 6% ROIC. So the point of this page is there's significant variance across the segments and companies. What does that mean? Go to the next slide. What you slide is, there has to be something which drives performance, right? Is it you're preordained to be 40% or you're preordained to be 6%? And that's the question a lot of our clients ask. And so we went and looked and said, of say, what does that mean? And I'm gonna start with the good news. The good news is it's really not the company's starting point. So let me explain this chart to you. The y-axis is you see from 2002 to 2007 where companies were on quartiles on their ROIC. So roughly 15% was in the top quartile, going from top to bottom on the left-hand side of the slide. 5% was in the second quartile, 2% is in the third quartile, and so on. And the x-axis or the horizontal axis you see on the top is the companies which are in the top quartile, second quartile, third quartile, bottom quartile, but for the 2013 to 2017 time period. The shaded gray portion, which is the 15%, the 2%, the 5%, and the 15%, which goes orthogonal, basically says a company was a top quartile and remained in the top quartile, or was in the second quartile and remained in the second quartile, and so on. So what this really tells you is, if you really look, only a small portion, only 15% of the companies started in top quartile ROIC and stayed in the 15%. Or if you look at the bottom, only 15% of the companies started in the bottom quartile of ROIC performance and stayed there. That's good news. That means you're not preordained to stay where you are started. Or put it differently, I'm an optimist. I would say over 60% of the companies saw an improvement in their performance or decline in their performance between the two periods. So point number one, there is a big difference in performance, but what is good is you're not pre, wherever you start, you're not preordained to stay there. Go to the next slide, please. Then you sort of look and say, okay, does this mean, what is your starting size? Starting size is revenue, starting size is market cap. That's what we plotted on the x-axis. You'll see revenue and the y-axis is ROIC and you'll find there's no correlation. The R squared is 0 0.01, meaning there's really no correlation. It doesn't matter what your starting point is. You could have been big, and at the bottom of the barrel, or you could have been small and could have been top of the barrel, and vice versa. And similarly, the question we looked at was it how much money you spent, which is a function of your capex. And fortunately or unfortunately, there isn't anything there either. R squared is 0 0.05, which means uh, there is really no correlation. And hence, it doesn't matter how much money you spend, your ROIC does not have a positive or a negative correlation. So just to recap, your ROIC is varies across companies. It's not preordained. Like if you're rich, you don't stay rich. If you're poor, you don't stay poor. Two is it's not preordained on your revenue or preordained on your capex. So what explains it? So one of the things we did at McKinsey is we went and we plotted all the ROIC and we also did this for TRS, total return to shareholders. We also did this for alpha multiple. So we did this for multiple variables. We show on this chart just the ROIC. And here we find there is a positive correlation to this thing called CORI or quality of revenue index. So the next question obviously is gonna be what is CORI? So if you go to the next slide, what you find is CORI is, think of it as a pedigree of your quality, a pedigree or a quality of the company's revenue. And quantitatively, it determines by five factors. One, the market the company plays in. The end market's the geography. You'll say, yeah, Nick, I got it. That's uh, self-explanatory. 
Second, the type of customers, meaning are the customers they are playing with, are they playing with winning customers? Or are they doing with the laggards? Are they industry leaders or the industry laggards? Are the customers themselves, their performance improving or not? Third is within that customer, what is the company position? Meaning are they in all new programs? Are they doing NPI? Are they in the end of line? Or you know, are they just a commodity product? Are they mainstream product? First three, you will say, yes, that those are intuitive, makes sense. What we've then found very interesting is four and five has an outsized, uh, outsized impact on Cori. One is what is the uniqueness of company offering? Meaning how much of it is proprietary, how much of that is designed in with the customer, how much of this uh, appeals to a particular pain point or a solution for your end customer? Uh, which you can sort of say, is it si single or multi-sourced? And last but not the least is a monetization model, meaning is it a one-time sale or is it a recurring revenue? And is it something where you have a transactional relationship with your customer or is it a long-term relationship with the customer where the customer keeps coming back to you? So the razor, razor blade model, you know, packaging, packaging material model, you can use any euphemism, but really the monetization model, what is your recurring revenue plays a big role in your query and in return plays a big role on your ROIC. If you then go to the next slide, what you find is query is not something which you sort of say you're born in with a query. Either you have a high query or a low query. Query is really determined by what we call how well you play on your innovation cube. The innovation cube is let me explain this chart on page 21, which is how are you doing on products? How are you doing on operations? And how are you doing on business model? Typically when companies and everyone think of innovation, it's thought about innovation along the product line. Do you have a mousetrap? Do you have a better mousetrap? And so that's uh, the obvious innovation, right? How well are you innovating? How well are you doing on your fundamental core R&D? How, how quickly are you introducing new products, which is refreshing your product portfolio? How much is it better than out there? How, how much is it a segment of one? How much are, is a customer, you're anticipating a customer pain point and solving? That's sort of stating the obvious. Then comes how well are you innovating on operations? How well are you making and selling it? How well are you deploying capital? How well are you having your process discipline, not only in your operations, but also in your back office? How well are you innovating? And what we find very interesting here, just to give you one data point, is if you look at, this is not true for packaging, but across all industrial companies, the average EBITDA for an industrial company runs roughly 13%, while the best in class or segment of one runs at 30%. So which is very interesting is innovation in operations does reflect immediately in a better EBITDA, and by definition reflects in a better ROIC. And then last axis is the innovation in business model. And this is an interesting concept because if you look at the industrial segment itself broadly, but then look within packaging, there's not been a lot of innovation in the business model, meaning how do you actually create a platform? How do you really create an ecosystem to allow various companies or various solutions to be brought together for the end customer? And in that process, you're creating a recurring revenue or a different cost-free revenue model. And more important or equally important, how do you use this to get closer to the customer, get to know the customer well, you can anticipate what they want, and back to the point, you're creating a different kind of relationship with the customer rather than just being a vendor. And if you look at, unfortunately, this is not in the uh, industrial space, but if you look at the broader tech space with all the new disruptive companies, that's what they're trying to do, which is how do you innovate on the business model how do you innovate to get a platform that allows you to get to the customer, that allows you to get more data, allows you to monetize that data so that you can collect it from data to information and use that to service the customer better and in that process, drive better stickiness and drive better ROIC. If you then go to the next slide, And this is looking backwards, right? I mean, obviously uh, we can predict the future, but bringing it back to us, what we find very interestingly is when we looked at the packaging space, 
we found there already are instances of successful companies who are pursuing multiple levels to improve their query. So uh, apologies for the small print on this, but if you look at this, you'll see on the product side, which is a middle box, uh, you'll find is um, companies are using a new playbook. They're using advanced analytics, they're using next-gen manufacturing, product portfolio optimization to really innovate and sort of say, how do you move, uh, sorry, I apologize, it's the left-hand side, uh, how to move on operations. If you look at the middle box, this is how do you innovate on the product side, how do you get smart products, how do you use blockchain for traceability, how do you use sustainable materials? New materials keeps constantly coming up, which allows you to uh, have better shelf life, better cost, better performance, while being environmentally friendly. And then the business model, which is the one, my earlier comment, which has historically not been the area of focus for industrial companies, is starting to happen, which is you're really starting to see portfolio of businesses coming together, different monetization model, different go-to-market, which has all really now led to a point where you're no longer having the classical, you know, you, you sell a product once, you make a product one, uh, and you make revenue once, but you're building a different relationship and companies are very, very successfully starting to do this. And especially in the packaging space as the work we did over the last year, what we found was there is, an interesting set of both interesting startups or newcomers, but also incumbents who are really doing this. And I, I truly believe that those companies are going to see a big improvement in the quality of revenue, which is going to relate into a, a better ROIC in the coming years. And if we are having this conversation again in five years, I think we'll be showing you a chart with not a 0.6 or 0.7 uh, economic profit, but more in the three to 4% as we showed for the other companies which would be putting the packaging sector as a whole in the top quartile or at least above average in economic profit. If you go to the next slide, we've sort of talked a while and so we'll pause and take questions from the group. What we want to start is sort of saying, what does this all mean? What are the imperatives for companies? And what we would say is it really comes down to five big imperatives at a company level. And we put them across three groups, you know, where to play, how to play, and when to play. In where to play, it's very easy to sort of say, hey, there are a lot of things going, how do we prioritize? And what we found is successful companies have prioritized two or three large efforts to pursue. So whether it's internal to go drive in EBITDA improvement or external to drive an innovation on products or packaging uh, or operations so that they're able to prioritize, they're able to put their best resources, and when they put their best resources, win. Two is the how to play. And one of the interesting things we found is, for a long time, packaging sectors were very siloed. Companies did everything within the four walls. But what we now find more and more is working more jointly with your customers, understanding their pain point, defining and what they need, and collaborating with them makes a big difference. And also how you build the offering. So it's not everything needs to be built. It can be done through partnership. It can be done through um, IP transfer. It can be done through, you know, tuck in m &A. That plays a big role. And then being very honest on what capabilities are needed because as these big disruptions come in, what we are finding is it's very hard for any company, for any company of any size to have all the capabilities in-house. So having a capability heat map, and we as McKinsey do this for a lot of our clients, which is sort of saying, where are you on your capabilities and what are the capabilities you need to win in the next decade? And really getting that done scientifically rather than sort of saying, my gut feel I need X versus Y. So really understanding what capabilities you need and then figuring out what is the process, just like if you need an equipment, you will do a CapEx requisition. It is similar to that sort of saying, what is the capability gap you have and then figuring out the process to get it is going to play a big part. And then the last one is when to play. As much as we all say everything needs to be done now, the short answer is not everything needs to be done now. There is a timing element and it's very important to realize when do you need to make an investment? And as I tell all my clients, it is as important to know when to jump in to know when not to jump in, right? So really doing this we call it the test and learn or fail fast model 
of increasing the odds of winning, knowing when to enter and how to enter, meaning are you going to enter with a big bank or you're going to enter with a test with a pilot makes a big difference. And the when to, elim, when to play plays a big role so that you don't enter too early or you don't enter too late. So in conclusion, what I would sort of say to recap, when we did this work, we were very excited with the trend line the packaging sector has been in. They have made the reverse the trend from destroying value to creating value. They have all the ingredients to have a great tailwind with all the disruptive technologies coming their way. They are in the center of the storm in a good way to drive these disruptions and to capture it. And last but not the least is what we're finding is there are a lot of companies already starting to make the, the move to benefit from these trend builds to improve the quality of revenue. And based on the data, based on the work we did, we would say improving the quality of revenue is not just a nice thing to do or a good thing to do. It actually does improve your ROIC, which in return should improve your shareholder uh, returns. So in conclusion, I would say great place to be. And um, we've had great times and there's even more great times for the packaging sector. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you for the insights you've provided us and your latest report on the packaging solutions industry. Um, I'd like to open up the session for questions. Please enter any questions you would like to have answered in the questions box on your screen um, or in the chat. We can address both. And um, we'll give that just a moment for a couple of questions. And uh, we do have one question um, for Nick. Um, Nick, considering the amount of disruption 2.0 that's taking place in the industry that you talked about at some length, where would you say you're seeing innovation happening? Is it coming from the OEM side or is it really coming from the CPG side? Re Rebecca, that's a very interesting question because historically when you look at the packaging sector, what you'll find is most of the innovation, if not all of the innovation, came from the, the material guys or the CPG. But I would say in the last few years, the last three, four years, you're starting to see a lot of the innovation also happen in the packaging sector. Meaning, if you look at the innovative materials, if you look at the smart technologies incorporating sensors, and that is being done by packaging material companies, obviously in conjunction, in collaboration with, the, with their customers. So to answer your question now, I would say as disruption 2.0 happens, you're starting to see innovation being widespread. It's no longer the preview of one company or even one sector. And we believe that's a good thing because that's the only way you're going to push this industry forward and also ensure value creation and value capture is spread out. Okay, great. Um, and we do have several questions coming in now. Um, one of our attendees would also like to know, what are the metrics that you use to know when to play? Uh, that's an interesting question. This is, um, I mean, as we say, everybody can be a Monday morning quarterback. After the event, we could have said, we can say, oh, you should have never gotten, or oh boy, you should have bought the winning lottery ticket. Um, so it's very easy after the event to say when to enter. It's very hard to say before. But we use three parameters um, to really judge a company's readiness when to enter or when not. The first one is when we look, uh, and let's go down the order from the, where the, the, the trend is, where the sector is, and where the company is. When we look at a trend, uh, we look and say, is this trend been around where there's a lot of VCs putting in money and very honestly, VCs have, the, have that habit of putting in 50 bets and if one wins, that's good enough for them. And so if there's a lot of VC activities and have been around for a few years, we sort of say, okay, this trend is now starting to come from niche to mainstream. So this is a time at least worth considering. Versus if it's something where really there's no VC investments, there's, it's in early stages, we sort of say, look, it's in its infancy and you better let the VCs play around with it a little bit before you jump in. The second is we come at the sector level and we look at where are the companies playing it, meaning 
whether the big companies or the, whether the incumbents are starting to make the investments or starting to talk about it. And again, what we find here is there is often a chatter and before the investments happen and then the investments happen. Um, and then they, I mean, like every other thing, when you make the investment for the first time, you fail. And so there's a couple of rounds before it happens. And then the last is you, where are you as a company? Because obviously if you're a large company with a heavy balance sheet, you can take more risk. And so one of the things we often say is whether you are the big guy or small guy does play a role in where you want to play and when you want to play, i.e. the time you enter really depends on how much risk are you willing to take. But independent of the risk, it's a question of fail fast model. Given all these innovations, what we find is there are very few companies who can actually get it right the first time. You want to go and tip your toe, learn from it. And I mean, I know we say this with confidence, fail fast because the first time you are gonna fail, but fail fast, but really learn from it to move on. But it's really a combination of those three things is when you make a decision on when to move. Because you don't want to move in too early, but you also don't want to move in too late. And that is really gated by what is the financial power you have or what is the financial balance sheet you have. Okay, great. Um, and we do have um, a few more questions coming in. Um, another attendee would like to know if you would be able to discuss the adoption of MAAS or what I'm understanding as metal as a service uh, in the packaging equipment space. So, Shaker, would you like to talk about it? I know we looked at it. I mean, at least the work when we looked at it, we would say, you know, we did not come to a, a definite conclusion on which way it was going. So I would say, um, if I answer that question, it will be a guess on my part because we really could not come up with any data points to sort of say what the adoption was or what was rising, driving it and was it going to become a mainstream or a niche. But Shikha, would you like to comment? So I, I think you've captured it, Nick. I, I think, you know, I think it is, um, the way I characterize it is, it's, you know, I think there's definitely interest in that option. Um, you know, I, I think the, the jury is still out on, you know, how quickly It'll get it, it how quickly the adoption will scale up or ramp up and um, it, it across specifically across what parts of the market um, but you know there's definitely there's definitely interest in it as far as I can tell okay thank you shaker and um Another attendee would like to know from, from either of you, do you anticipate additional consolidation of um, packaging manufacturers and suppliers, or is this trend slowing down? I think, I mean, this one I'm looking at the crystal ball. Uh, I would say the, con the consolidation wave has started. Um, I don't think personally it has slowed down and I don't think it'll slow down given there is still a long uh, tail of fragmentation. And so my hypothesis, and I, this, I'm sure I'm gonna be proven wrong in a couple of years when we get back on this call, but I'm going to say you're not going to see a slowdown at least in the near future. And maybe in this, in Nick, if, if I can just add one, one thing to it quickly. Please. I, I just want to separate between the pace of M&A and the pace of consolidation. I think the pace of M&A, uh, you know, our take is has is had historical highs and will likely continue. Now, what the, the other interesting trend that we've noticed in recent years is the portion, the proportion of M&A that goes that is being um, deployed towards increasing scale versus um, acquiring innovation and capabilities. And that percentage, that focus on acquiring innovation capabilities is increasing, right? So, so our take is, listen, I think the, the pace of M&A will continue at a, you know, at a pretty healthy uh, clip, um, but increasingly some of that will be diverted to, uh, to building new capabilities, acquiring new innovation, and therefore, and, and less so on building scale. Uh, and what that means is obviously, you know, we'll have to wait and see, but M&A as a whole should continue at a bit. Okay, thank you, Shaker. And um, 
We have another question. Is there a feeling that there is sufficient innovation going forward regards to eliminating the plastic bottle conundrum? Um, can I ask a clarifying question? Is it just the plastic bottle or is it pl plastic as a material for innovation uh, or for packaging? I would, the question did not specify. I would assume that it's plastics in general. Um, I can let you know if the asker um, changes, but let's go with plastics in general. So, I mean, this is a hot topic, right? I mean, when I say hot topic, it's a hot topic in social media. It's a hot topic with the end consumer. Um, and this has been around for quite some time, and I think it has gained traction. I mean, like, for example, San Francisco, where Shikha and I live, have now banned uh, plastic water bottles at the airport. Um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, trends where there is actions, there's regulatory actions being taken or being promoted or economic costs being added. Having said that, I would say it's going to be, it's, it's changing consumer behavior. It's about changing customer preference. And uh, if you're a consumer flying through San Francisco, now you need to remember to carry your own water bottle uh, to fill up your water, or you have to go find a water fountain uh, it should be readily available. And so I think it's going to be one of this, and I think the word conundrum is absolutely the right thing. It's not going to be solved, at least our own, our, our finding is, it's not going to be solved by one individual or it's not going to be solved by one company, right? It's going to be one where there is a role played by plastic bottle, and I'm calling out the bottle here in particular, but then we can talk about packaging and uh, plastics in general, is there is a, a role being played and it will be solved when two things happen, when uh, the substitute is found with the same service level, the same quality, and the same, or at least comparable price point. And so I think to solve that conundrum, there are a lot of companies which are investing time, there are a lot of companies which are investing the effort and are genuinely, uh, if you look at the sustainability effort and everything, there are a lot of companies who really want to drive this change. And these are companies which are in the process of either making plastic stuff or in the process of using plastic. So we will we see that earnest effort by companies, but I think it's gonna take time to break this conundrum just because you really need, this is a, it's a multi-party solution and all the multi-parties have to come together to solve the quality, the cost, the availability and so on. And that's just gonna take time, would be my hypothesis. So um, you mentioned that recently in San Francisco, plastic bottles have been um, banned in the airports. So the asker has come back and would like to know if you've heard anything specific to bottle the bottles themselves. Or, I mean, we spoke generally about plastics, um, but have you heard anything, I mean, even given the recent ban, have you heard anything about plastic bottles specifically? Shaker, kind of have you event? heard... I Shikhar, have you heard, I personally, I mean, as I said, this is a hot topic uh, for the different stakeholders every time we talk. I mean, and it's, it is genuinely a serious problem which that needs to be addressed, right? So there are companies talking about it. There are different consumer groups talking about it. And as I said, there's a lot of regulatory actions and economic uh, actions being taken. But um, I have, I mean, this is my own personal observation and Shikhar, correct me if I'm wrong. I have personally not... Uh, seen sort of is there a substitute to a plastic bottle which i mean obviously there's the stainless steel bottles which people are using and uh, but what is the adoption rate and how is that working i i don't have visibility to it no that's exactly Jacob? right Nick. yeah no we i don't think we have a holistic view if you will on 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 the on the outlook for plastic bottles we've not studied that particular question um and and as nick said there's increasing uh, chatter about it. Uh, you know, I think there's increasing consciousness among consumers about the impact of plastic, and in particular, single-use plastic bottles. Um, uh, and 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 you know, I think there's definitely segments of consumers that are, you know, taking action on their own, like getting their own bottles or minimizing usage of reusing plastic bottles. But we have not done a systematic study to to have a to have a really strong point of view. Yeah, I would say the, that's what I would just reaffirm. The comments we made are more, um, I would say, um, hearsay or what we have heard, but we have not done a structured work on the, the space to really understand what is happening or what can be done to solve this conundrum. OK, 
Okay, and um, we have another question, a couple more coming in. Uh, another attendee would like to know um, if you've uh, seen any disruption technologies or heard about any disruption technologies in the defense or aerospace industry. Uh, for packaging? But I, I would I would uh, say yes for any kind of um, packaging and defense or aerospace. Shekhar, you should remind me. I mean, when we looked at innovations in packaging, I'm trying to think here, what we found was a lot of the innovations was happening in the consumer space, meaning how package is delivered in e-commerce, how is food delivered to the end consumer when they, for example, order a hot burger or a hot french fries. I, I'm, I'm trying to think, and I, I'm, again, I cannot think of any big innovation which I would have sort of said, wow, this is something I have hearing for the first time in aerospace and defense. Again, Shikhar, I'll we'll defer to you. No, you're exactly right. I mean, I think broadly speaking, you know, I think one of the, one of the slides we presented, we shared this data point, 60% of packaging is 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 for is um, spend is in consumer related segments and about 40% is industrials. And within industrials, obviously aerospace and defense is is one of the primary segments for you know, for um, for many many different supplier groups, including packaging. What we I, at least I don't have a, a you know I, I've not looked specifically at applications in aerospace and defense. Uh, or, or looked at exactly what innovations are taking shape in that space. Um. Okay, thank you. And we're just waiting for a couple more questions. Maybe just give it another moment. And just so everyone is aware, um, we will be sending a link to the full report uh, to all attendees of the webinar. Um, so um, all of this information plus more will be available to you shortly. The webinar has also been recorded, so if you would like to review anything, um, you will be able to do so within the next 24 hours at pmmi.org. And we do have another question. Um, actually, we have a few more just uh, pop up. Um, another uh, attendee would like to know um, if you could discuss which e-commerce business has the largest growth in packaging innovation. I would say, I mean, Shekhar, you should correct me wrong. You looked at it. I think this is actually across the entire e-commerce, meaning we have seen innovation in like in e-commerce buying buying perishable material through online has driven a lot of innovation because now the, the material has to be fresh, has to be protected, has to be preserved. We have seen a lot of innovation in apparel because obviously you want your apparel to arrive at the right time. You want to have, arrive it in the way you ordered it. We have seen it in food delivery where we've seen a lot of innovation because obviously going and drinking a smoothie at McDonald's or having a French fries uh, is very different than having it delivered to your house 30 minutes later. We're seeing a lot of innovation happening in the the pizza industry, for example, the pizza packaging, how it comes to your house. So I would say, fortunately or unfortunately, the innovation has been true across pretty much every one of the e-commerce channel. I mean, uh, on relative basis, I don't know if one is significantly ahead of the other or not. And Shaker, again, I know we looked at it, I, I don't know the number of companies and so on, you might have the data, but I would sort of say we have seen it pretty much in a good way, widespread up pretty much across all parts of the e-commerce chain. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think if we, if we, if you recall the framework that we, the three P framework that we presented before, right? Um, um, protect, promote, and perform. I, you know, I think a lot of the innovation has been, I'd, I'd say more, you know, some on the protect sites so and new materials that are more sustainable, during during the shipment process and also have a lower carbon footprint for example um a lightweight can reduce your you know reduce are easy to easy to transport so there's been a fair bit of innovation on the protect side uh, but a lot of the innovation actually is on the perform side so there are things like you know um more on the for example with with uh, uh, like nick said you know having smart tags or fids and packaging so that they're easier to process in your warehouses, 
you know, having, uh, for example, the ability to track the contents and, and assure that the contents have not been tampered with, uh, innovations that protect the uh, or, or 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 you know give you track temperature through the through the through the entire delivery um, uh, chain. So the, lots of innovation. I'd say you know I, th I think if I had to hazard a guess, I'd say the majority of it has been on the perform side. There's been a fair bit on the on the protect side as well. And then in, in keeping with that sort of um, protect versus perform theme, have you noticed anything about trends um, in corrugated boxes versus shelf-ready boxes for retail? Can you ask the question again? I'm sorry, I did not understand the question. So, so we were talking a little bit about um, protect and, and perform. And uh, one of our attendees would like to know if you've noticed any trends between the use of corrugated boxes, um, yep. which I'm understanding as being more for protection purposes, although they can be performed as well, um, versus shelf-ready boxes um, or retail-ready boxes, which are, are kind of the same thing, but they're more performance if, if um, they seem more performance-focused because they have to just be ready for display. Did that make sense? Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting question. Yeah, Shikha, go ahead. You know, I was saying, I, I think it is, and, and you're seeing a bit of that. I know the question is about retail, but you're seeing a lot of that actually in the e-commerce space, right? So historically, this, there was the same packaging for retail and e-commerce, and the e-commerce players would have to take out the take out the, um, the contents of a, of, a, of a, you know, for example, a tertiary package, and then, Put it in a different package and ship it to the consumer. Now you get you now there's some there's a fair bit of innovation in making sure the primary packaging is also can also be used as secondary packaging or tertiary packaging, right? Um, and and that trend extends to retail as well. Um, I think that the the drivers are multifold, but primarily it's it's cost, right? So because all of this packaging creates a fair bit of cost for the retailers and e-commerce players, so reducing that cost and from a sustainability standpoint, reducing the amount of material that's used. So, so we are definitely seeing some trends. I, I, I personally have seen more on the e-commerce side, but um, I've seen a couple of examples on the retail side as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Shaker. Um, and we'll just give it just a couple more seconds for any more questions um, from our attendees. Um, if there's anything else that um, you would like to know. And again, we are going to make this full report available to all who attended the webinar today. Okay, well, um, on behalf of PMMI, uh, CPA, the Association for Contract Packagers and Manufacturers, and IOPP, the Institute of Packaging Professionals, thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. Uh, as a final note, you'll receive an email to complete an evaluation for today's webinar. Please complete the evaluation as soon as possible and let us know how we can improve our webinars in the future. Um, Nick, Shaker, everyone involved, thank you so much and have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you all. Well,